Hi, everybody. We're going on a Strata Cruise. It's going to be just worlds of fun, and details are listed below. I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle now. And Bill, today, uh, President Obama, the former President of the United States, has come upon a solution to a lot of the world's problems. And uh, let me, I want to read it directly uh, from his quote. He's uh, speaking at a conference in Singapore and actually kind of at a private aspect of this conference. And here's what he says would result in a significant improvement across the board, around the world, in just about everything, living standards and outcomes. Women in leadership positions in every country of the world. Uh, I'm absolutely confident, he said, that for two years, if every nation on earth was run by women, you would see a significant improvement across the board, living standards, outcomes, just about everything. Uh, Bill, first of all, I guess the question that immediately comes to mind is, wow, the guy was president of the United States for eight years and never suggested stepping down to make way for a woman. I think we ought to send him a, a stuffed panda that is his size and make it the first annual pandering of the year award uh, because it is, that is simply the most flagrant case of, of, um, of vote pandering I've ever heard in my life. That really does take the cake. It really does. Now, he was in, uh, in Sing Singapore, as I mentioned, so he may be running for some global position. Uh, he's pandering for votes, but it's interesting. He points out that women are not perfect. He he leads off by saying, what? Now, wi "Now, women, well, I just that's, want that's the end. That's the end of him in, in the, the Democratic <laughs> Party. It's just a matter of uh, hours now before we him, hear him being uh, excommunicated as a white supremacist." But go ahead. He says, "I just want you to know you're not perfect, but what I can say, pretty indisputably, which is an interesting qualifier, pretty indisputably, is that you're better than us, meaning that you're better than men." Bill, he also says that he's. Absolutely. So it's pretty indisputably that, that they're better than us. And he's absolutely confident that the world would be a better place if all the governments were run by women for a couple of years. Um, I guess let's just take his, uh, his proposal at face value. Do you think that that's something that would uh, actually come to pass? First of all, he's wrong. Secondly, he's weak. And third, he's divisive. Which one do you want to deal with first? Why is he wrong? He's wrong because there's no evidence to support that whatsoever. Many people say if women ran the world and the militaries, then there would be no more war. And they're right about that because if women ran uh, the militaries of the world, there'd be no more human beings. We'd all be extinct. Um, so this idea that women somehow have this superior sense of emotional control or some kind of superior sense of wisdom or all the rest of it, just, it's just not true. It's not borne out by any evidence whatsoever. And what we find is, is that women leaders are about as good or as bad as men leaders, generally speaking. I, I thought very highly of- So why of, wouldn't there uh, be any people in the world then? If, I, why, I, why thought, would be I thought rather highly of, of Margaret Thatcher, but I didn't think so highly of, um, of uh, Angela Merkel. And the reason that there wouldn't be any people left is because, is because my experience certainly has been that, and I think most people's experience has been that women hold grudges and are more inclined to uh, not overlook or forgive a transgression uh, it's by significant margins. I'm hoping our female viewers will be able to overlook that most recent comment. That I hope they made. don't overlook it because it's true and everybody knows it's true. So, so Bill, um, the president of the United States says that and it, this kind of led off of a question, as far as I can follow the thread through the, the story that I read about it, um, that he was basically saying that a lot of the problems in the world are caused by old men uh, or old, old people, mostly men, holding on to power too long. Don't you think he has he's, he got a point there? Okay, so let's go to the divisive part of it. So we said, said weak, divisive, and wrong. So uh, covered the wrong, let's talk about the divisive. The entire purpose of, of progressive politics is to divide people so that they can be turned against the biggest particular um, chunk of the pie. In other words, if you have a nation that's united, you can't attack that really. You can, you can basically criticize it from the outside, but that's not gonna do any good. The entire idea of the progressive movement is to divide, as an example, America into different tribes and set the tribes at war, not against each other, but against the middle, against, against the big remaining obstacle to personal power for progressives. And so this is yet another example, and, an, and a particularly flagrant example, of Barack Obama and the progressive movement 
saying things that are as inflammatory and divisive as possible in order to gin up um, some enthusiasm for this election coming up where they're going to get walloped. If I had said that, um, you know, I was talking to a group of, uh, of uh, women or, or, or a group of men and I, you know, I'd said, you know, guys, we're just better than they are. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's just, I just think that, you know, you guys, you're not perfect, but you're certainly better than they are. That would be considered a divisive statement. If he were to say that to a white audience, it'd be considered a, a capital statement. But it doesn't matter in this particular case because, because Barack Obama is speaking to, presumably speaking to women, but he's not just speaking to women. He's speaking to people who have often felt and have been made to feel that their entire political philosophy of failure is not working because other mean people have made sure that it's not working. And this is just another brick in that wall of, of, uh, of poverty and repression and murder that they're trying to build. And I'm not falling for it. I'm not going to fall for it. And let me go to the, let me go to the week. Finally. Um, I'm sure Barack Obama had finished his, his soy latte before he made the speech and, and I have no doubt about that whatsoever. I saw Barack Obama, the president of the United States of America, switch seats after flirting with the Danish uh, prime minister under the icy glare of Michelle Obama. And I thought to myself, there is no way on God's earth that I would ever, ever, ever give away that much to, our, to, to, to foreign powers. I would never give away anything that indicated that I was that whipped, that I was that subservient as a person with a backbone. Now, if I was going to have a private discussion with my wife afterward and she wanted to get exceedingly angry at me, that's something else. But for the president of the United States to wither under this, under this uh, icy gaze of the, of the first lady, who's not elected anywhere and has no business saying anything about this kind of thing, if he's going to do that and he's going to get up and move and hang his head and, and you know, and, and go sit in the corner, what do you think the Soviet Union and the Chinese leadership think of that? For, forget what they think about him as a person. What do you think they think about that man as a commander in chief, as a person who is going to stand up for what he believes in, who believes in the honor and integrity of the office and the country to which he was elected to be chief executive? It tells me that he's weak, insecure. He's he's uh, unbelievably um uh, passive and not fit to be president of the United States. And by the way, just so, just for those of you who are watching, uh, the inverse is exactly true as well. Needless to say, if Margaret Thatcher were sitting next to somebody and, and, and Dennis were to give him, give her an icy stare, she wouldn't move. She give ice, she give Dennis an icy stare. So it's got nothing to do with the particular sex of the people involved. It's got to do with, with the with the weakness and the and the lack of fortitude and the lack of of um, of understanding how important these kind of optics really are, and, and just to close this particular beat out, um, the reason Barack Obama didn't stand up to Michelle is because the idea of standing up to Michelle is inconceivable to Barack Obama, and and I find the idea of a president of the United States who takes orders from anybody, anybody, to be pretty disturbing. Well, Bill, perhaps there's a difference, though, between weakness and humility, because this whole there uh, is this but whole humility. Stream, humility is a trait that Barack Obama has never encountered except in a dictionary and only then through intense puzzlement. So you're not going to lay the humility thing on me with this one, not with this guy. Well, perhaps you just haven't heard this quote yet, because this thought stream that we're following here uh, had its fountainhead in the uh, question from his interlocutor about whether he would consider going back into political leadership. And he said that he believed in leaders stepping aside when the time came. And that's what led to these comments about old men holding on to power. And he said, um, it's important for political leaders to try and remind themselves that you are there to do a job, but you are not there for life. You are not there in order to prop up your own sense of self-importance or your own power. See, curious, Bill, it was a self-deprecating remark that expressed yeah. his humility. Was he was he aiming that remark to his former vice president, former secretary of state, and other secretary of state? Was he was that who he was addressing up there? He he was just speaking to the audience and to a the people person who've who never been elected and who never will be elected. I see. Well, if he had said that on stage with Barack, with uh, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, and and John Kerry beside him, and turned to them and said that, that would have gotten my attention. But as it turns out, he didn't do that. It's just false modesty from a guy who managed through sheer luck and through and through the through the through the absolute perfect timing of where the country was 
uh, racially and historically and all the rest, just perfect timing, just walked into the highest land, highest office in the world, and now has nowhere else to go. I'm sure he thought about being president of the United Nations, but that's not really very much power. Everybody knows it. If the, if the role of God King is restored, however, I'm sure he'll be up for returning to politics in that particular instance. But until then, telling people who don't get elected, who never get elected, that we should not be elected for long, we should only just do our little terms and go home, is a hell of a thing to say from a Democrat who's, who's uh, vice president and both secretaries of state have been in politics for 40 or 50 years each. Well, he has gone his way into the private sector. His wife is uh, occasionally writing a book. He and his wife are both cooperating with a little uh, TV production enterprise. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's not injecting himself into the Democrat primary, and he's uh, relatively quiet on the political front. So it seems like he is, you know, a, a modern day Cincinnatus, is he not? Yes, of course. Let's deal with each one of these one by one. He's not injecting himself into the political front because he knows full well that his former a political ally was deadly poison and lost the easiest slam dunk election in the history of the United States. And he's not supporting his current uh, uh, connection to the Democratic field, Joe Biden, because he understands Joe Biden at his prime was kind of a creepy, kind of a silly guy and not really worth putting your personal name on the line for. So that explains that there's nothing to do with humility. As far as his forays into the private sector goes, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Because here's a guy who once was the most powerful man in the world, who has openly declared he's going to enter into movies and uh, in other areas, and has not made so much as a peep. There's not a peep, not a not a not a single chirp on Twitter, not a single flash of light on the entire horizon to indicate that Barack Obama is now in the entertainment business, which tells me that this guy is risen to the level of his success that he would have reached in the private sector, which is not very much. So um, I don't see any of this as signs of greatness. I see all of this as signs of confirmation of, of the guy's failure, confirmation of his weakness, confirmation of his, of his utter, utter endless desire to, to divide the country and the world into as many pieces as he possibly can, all of which powered by an ego that is, you know, I, I really, when you think about it, you really have to go back to Vanilla Ice to get somebody with that much ego and that little talent, honestly. Boy, it's a good thing there's a Google uh, to get that reference. Um, Bill, final question here. Um, and this is a, a little more personal, hits a little closer to home. If you look at the statistics on YouTube, um, among the people who watch your channel on YouTube, about 85, 86% of them um, are apparently male. And I don't mean that they're apparent, like if you met one of them, you could apparently divine that he was male, but that YouTube thinks that 86% of your audience is male. And they um, are, they're manly men. Yes. Uh, to what do you attribute the fact that there's such a relatively small percentage of women? Is it, is it quite the opposite of what President Obama says and women just aren't interested in the political realm? Or is it because, uh, you know, the ubermensch that um, is uh, the nominal head of this network is, n is just not appealing to women? I attribute it mostly to an overabundance of reason and common sense. Um, that's, that's what I would mainly attribute it to. Uh, you know, I don't start these uh, sex wars or race wars. I don't. I don't start any of them. I find it to be incredibly rude, divisive, bad for the country and all the rest of it. But unlike the rest of the people on this um, goat rodeo, I am not willing to acquiesce to things simply because people expect me to. I certainly would never have started a conversation. You would never hear me do a project of any kind that began with the premise that women are not as good as men at whatever job they want to go to. Although I do believe there are some jobs they are not as good as men at and combat frontline troops are probably front of the line there. But with that said, I don't start any of these fights. But since this, since this narrative continues to grow unabated through the pop culture. My job is to just lay out as many speed bumps as I possibly can. And I think that's the reason why most of the audience here is men, because this, this entire philosophy, this entire channel is dedicated to the ideas of reason and common sense, discipline, and, and a, a, a kind of emotional selflessness, the ability to look at a situation, put your own personal feelings aside, and decide whether or not something is true or not so that you can act accordingly. That is that is another reason why they're not only male mostly, that's why they're also older, because it takes a while for life to beat the stupid out of you. 
But ladies and gentlemen, this episode of Bill Whittle Now has been brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. We also receive support from our friends over at the Patriot Post, America's News Digest, for which we will provide a link in the description below. Our buddies at Patreon have been faithful for a long time in contributing to this enterprise as well. And that cruise that Bill mentioned at the head of the program, if you'd like to get together with a bunch of like-minded people in a beautiful place with Bill and me and Stephen Green, then check out the link in the description below. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members for making this possible.